this session is going to be about cybersecurity with Elastic, and I'm going to talk to you about the XDR journey, what we did, how we did, and all those things. Myself, I'm Sriram Kanan. I'm the VP of Engineering at Barracuda's XDR division, and I have here with me Miriam Khalid, who's the um, head of offensive security um, in Cyber uh, Security Operations Center. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm going to start with um, the engineering side of things, and I'm going to hand it over to Miriam, who's going to talk about everything that's security. Um, we work for a cybersecurity company, and specifically in that cybersecurity company, we um, work for the XDR division. So I'm going to be talking about what is XDR as a part of the agenda, uh, what is the nature of data in XDR, uh, how do we do the ingestion, data ingestion, how do we pipeline the data that we do, uh, how do we store the data in, the, in, the, in what we call it as data lake, aka elastic search clusters, and how do we scale um, uh, search at scale. At, right after that, I'm going to call Miriam, who's going to talk about the SIM overview. She's going to talk about the investigation examples, detection examples, and then she's going to jump right ahead into the alarm to alert timeline and with the closing remarks. Before I explain what is XDR, I want you to um, think about a global security incident that happened recently. This helps me kind of tie back the experience that we're going to have in the next few minutes. And then with the closing remarks, we're going to uh, talk about it. So think of Log4j global security incident that happened a few months back. Um, we're going to uh, talk about how XDR would have reduced uh, the risk that would have posed uh, with such a security incident. So what is XDR? For people who don't know, uh, for people who, who, are, uh, who do know in the or live in the security industry, they know what it is. But people who don't know, this is extended visibility detection and response. This is a single pane of glass for all of the security silos to work in a cohesive fashion. It's just a collection of tools and technologies. So what does that mean? Um, extended visibility into all of these security silos, which is network, you talk about authentication, endpoints, cloud, email. You're able to um, get the data from all of these security systems and apply your secret sauce in it, which is what we do on a day in and day out, and then we enable the response, either in a manual fashion or in an automated fashion. We prefer the later. What is data to us? Um, not surprising for a lot of us here, um, we ingest tons of logs, just like anybody else who uses Elastic. Um, for us, it's logs from firewalls, it's logs from web servers, or any applications. You, you bring it, we, you know, we, uh, we make security sense out of it. Audit, information that can answer who, when, and what or a security incident that has already happened and been identified by another system. Typical example, AWS is God duty. Data in the context of SOC. So we are, uh, uh, my internal customers are security operations center. So what are the things that are most important to us? We want to grow our customer base, which means we want to grow our data as well, which means we want to grow our database. Um, we want to make sure we have horizontal um, expandability uh, that comes with it. Our data sources are pretty diverse. You know, the, com the, the business becomes more successful the more data sources we are able to correlate with. Um, naturally, when I'm talking about logs, pretty much all of the logs are unstructured, which means there is a lot of need for parsing. And um, we do a bunch of techniques, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, how do we make sense out of it? So we apply a common schema. For people who know already there's elastic common schema out there, we, we heavily depend on it as well. The search has to be performant. So as I said, our analysts are the end customers for us. So they, we don't want them to uh, spend um, you know, hours into doing some analysis for a security incident that has already happened, because every minute is crucial. So um, at, and at the same time, I want them to do multi-level aggregations as well. And the last one is cost. It, the cost has to be under the budget, so it, it shouldn't be like eating up our margin. So it's like pretty common sense there. There are different ways we can originate the data. So we use a bunch of techniques. Um, what's out there in the market, all of the uh, data integrations that we have currently uh, support APIs, uh, which means we're able to uh, get the data on, from their APIs on a, on a time, uh, time slot basis. Uh, we also support streaming uh, data with syslog. Uh, we have a proprietary sensor that we deployed out to our customer's network uh, using which we collect the data out. 
Um, we also collect the data from somebody's cloud, which means if you are with AWS, you can think about S3 as an, um, uh, as an example. Um, we also have um, network uh, data collection. The, the proprietary sensor that I talked about, it can plug into a span port of a firewall, for example, and collect the data from there. Um, we are also investigating into, uh, investing our time into um, agent-based log collection. Um, over our journey, um, we have tried out a few, and I think Elastic Agent is coming out as well, so we're, we are going to be um, uh, into that pretty soon. The integrations that we do for our customers, something that our customers see on, um, if they want to self-serve, uh, for example, if, if our customers have AWS's CloudTrail or GodDuty, or if they, they want to monitor Azure, for example, we give them a self-service feature in our dashboard using which they can send the data to us. When um, in a typical uh, API-based data integration, uh, the customers usually put those credentials specifically for those API access um, from the integrations page. And what we do behind the scenes is we spin up a Docker container, typically a file beat container, which comes with um, its own module that enables that data, data integration. Once the data comes into the file beat module, it, pull, it sends the data to a data pipeline. And we have a global data pipeline that listens in for such data. And, uh, and by the way, data pipeline is powered by Logstash. We send the data out to a data lake um, data lake in, in our world, we, uh, we have it in with Elastic Cloud. This is another um, way we collect the data um, uh, from our customers. We, as I said, we have a proprietary sensor. Um, the sensor sits in our customer's network. Um, the data ingress point is a syslog, which means inside their network they can send the data using syslog, and then we have various uh, mechanisms in place uh, where we can either identify or parse the data right in the sensor, and then out egress the data out using file beat to a data pipeline, just like the way I mentioned before, until it gets persisted into Elastic Cloud. A quick peek into the data transfer, I'm gonna uh, jump uh, into the data pipeline part of it, which is um, all of the sensors load balance that data out to four different ports in, uh, into the data pipeline, which is Logstash, um, and we have a lot of handshakes in place. Uh, we facilitate a pipeline to pipeline communication um, to persist the data in a specific cluster of our choosing, and that decision-making happens in per data pipelines. We have a thousands of uh, pipeline configurations um, that are uh, managed by XPACS manage, ma uh, management feature, using which we control all of the pipelines from one central location uh, dedicated for managing those pipelines. And as of now, we do, on an average, we do over 60,000 events per second, um, uh, with one kilobyte as the average event size. While we persist the data into the data lake, um, we make sure that pretty much all of the log streams come in as logs dash something, which means logs dash Office 365 or logs dash Okta as an example. They all get attached to a specific template. Some of the most important information um, uh, happens right here. Um, how do we um, apply an ILM policy so to such data? Like how long do you want to keep it? How long do you want to keep it in the hot, warm, and cold? All that decision gets attached right when the data comes in. While that's happening, we also attach um, some of the settings in here that says how many shards you want to apply for the data stream. Um, with Elastic Cloud in the picture, we, um, we make sure that we send the data to three different availability zones, uh, which enables highly available nature uh, of the whole uh, database. There is another important information here, which is the default pipeline. We make sure that all of the data comes into a, through a default ingest pipeline, and then we have a pipeline to pipeline ha uh, handover that happens per data source using which we are able to do the uh, parsing at scale. We use a lot of community developed um, um, parsers, and we have a bunch of custom made ones uh, too that makes all of this possible. Uh, in the previous slide, you would have seen the data gets stored into the Elasticsearch clusters. So um, we use one search cluster that kind of unifies all of, the, uh, all of the remote clusters using the remote cluster strategy that's provided in Kibana uh, that comes with Elasticsearch. This en literally enables our horizontal expandability um, across the globe. And using this, we are able to do uh, searches from one unified location. This is uh, one of the places our analysts tend to go back when they want to uh, do more analysis on a security incident that happened across different data sources. Um, 
for people who don't know the index pattern, uh, you know, you, you can, both the index remote clusters and the log, uh, the name of the log, they are like wildcard capable. So if you are like, if you have a use case, you want to search just in the US or in the EU, or uh, you want to say, I want to search the data for data lake versus something else, you know, you can do all of those wildcards right, right, right here. So once the data is persisted, um, the, the security use, co use cases are going to just follow, and I'm going to invite Miriam uh, to, uh, to walk, you all, walk you all over that. Can you guys hear me? Thank you, Sharam. Uh, my name is Mariam Khalid. I'm the Senior SOC Manager of Offensive Security um, at Barracuda, and I'm going to be talking about um, everything security and what we do in the XDR journey at Barracuda. So to get started, um, as Shiram mentioned, we have hundreds of integrations that are custom built and also community sourced. Um, we ingest data through sensors, API, or file beat. And once that data is ingested, um, that's where our security detections come into play. Um, and that's the magic sauce. And the integrations that we have is EDR, um, as Shira mentioned, we have cloud-based, firewall, on-prem, and authentication uh, monitoring. So we have EQL, um, threshold, uh, machine learning capabilities, also indicator match rule. And all those security detections are written to a SIM signal index. And that SIM signal index is either outputted to our SOAR integration, which we use times for, or Zendesk, um, which is our SOC ticketing system. So to dive into our SOAR integration, what we're doing here is we're automating our SOC analyst um, investigation workflow. We do threat intel enrichment with a lot of open source and Barracuda IOCs. We do deduplication this way. 10 events can get um, consolidated into one alert. This way, a customer does not get um, bombarded with a lot of alarms. We also automate a lot of the SOC processes, as I mentioned before, and one of the most important things is the orchestrated remediation. We're able to block an IP address if we deem it highly malicious on a customer's um, firewall. We're able to block hash values, IP addresses, URLs as well. Um, and the other output that goes into Zendesk, that's where the um, manual investigation comes into play. We have a seamless integration with um, Zendesk and Elastic through Logstash. So as I mentioned before, we have a 24 by 7, 365 global SOC that basically services all of our thousands of customers around the world. So let's dig into the manual investigation. There's, there's essentially three ways an analyst investigates in Elastic. Um, we have custom um, a discover searches saved, and those discover searches can query a whole index for a specific field in a certain time frame. We also have custom timeline feature as well, um, and what this timeline feature does, it helps us um, investigate thresholds and event correlation rules into one, into one UI. And then the dashboard, custom dashboard feature, we're able to visualize a lot of the graphs and metrics um, to see if there's any abnorm abnormalities or upticks on a certain event type. So I'm going to be going over all the different um, use cases that we currently have. So to give you an example of the event correlation use case, this one, this rule name is Okta, Potential Abuse of Repeated MFA. Um, and what this detects is when a threat actor abuses MFA by sending repeatedly, um, like, multiple requests for MFA. And this is important because, like, you know, the recent Uber attack um, where the threat actor sent multiple MFA requests and the user eventually accepted it because of fatigue. So if you look on the right at the screenshot, um, you can see the index pattern that we're querying is Okta. And the custom EQL query that we have, it's actually se sequenced by user ID in a max span of 10 minutes. And the, the, the way it's implemented is it searches for two denied events and followed by a successful event, and obviously we can manipulate this as much as we want. We can do 50 denied events followed by a successful one. Um, and I'm going to be going over this um, in, in, in a little bit, and we'll be going over the MITRE attack framework. Um, and essentially, all of our rules are mapped to MITRE. Um, and this one is a threshold example, and 
This one checks for Windows brute force authentication attempt and essentially it detects any abnormal behavior where one or more source performs 200 authentication failures for one user to one or more destinations. And as being part of the SOC, we see day in and day out, a lot of our customers get brute forced if they have external facing assets. And it's actually one of the top external, um, the top in initial threat, um, threat vector. Um, and then in the screenshot, you can see, um, as Shiran mentioned, that we have remote clusters and all of the remote clusters have specific sets of data sources. So we're querying all of our WMI data sources um, and the EQL query is looking for only failed attempts um, and we're also able to negate any events that we don't wanna, that we don't wanna be alerted on, for example, any service accounts. Um, and in the threshold, it's grouped by organization ID, user ID um, with a threshold or two, of 200 or above. Um, so machine learning is actually one of, the one of the new features that we're using in Barracuda XDR. It makes it really easy for us to detect anomalies in time series because we already have the data stored in Elasticsearch. We can either track one metric for one single machine or we can track hundreds of metrics for thousands of machines. Um, there is built-in tools such as data visualizer that, that helps you identify different fields that you may want to use. So the example that I'm showing here is a rare Office 365 city login. It basically detects um, any abnormal, abnormal login in, on a city cardinality. So say for example, I'm logging in from New York 99% um, of the time and there is a login in San Francisco, so that'll give it a high anomaly score based on the baseline it's created for my users. So the rule that we have, it detects a trigger, it generates an alert on anything that has a 50 or above um, anomaly score. And then the data visualizer below is a screenshot as well of the job that we've configured. Um, all the squares that are um, printed in red, those are the, the high anomaly score. So the threat intel example is um, communication to threat intel and what the search is for is any inbound or outbound traffic um, to a highly malicious IP address. Um, and this is the indicator match rule type. And what it's doing, it's searching for all of our clusters that have either source or destination in one of the fields. And it's also searching um, the threat intel index. So, and, it's, and then the EQL itself is just doing a match statement. So if destination or source IP matches the threat intel IOC IP, then it'll generate an alert. So to go into a little bit of detail with threat intel, we actually are using Elastic File Beat. So with the open source IOCs, we have about 6 million IOCs within the last 90 days. Um, we have Barracuda IOCs, so that gives us access to 130 million IOCs. And then third party, um, third party vendors such as VirusTotal and Shodan. So that gives, us a, that gives us access to about 10 billion. So with all those IOCs combined, um, we were able to reduce the false positive rates of our alarms to 55%. So as I mentioned before, um, the detections are kind of like the bread and butter of XDR product and our secret sauce. Um, we essentially have 800 custom um, elastic rules that we've created um, covering technologies such as network, on-prem, cloud, EDR. And these are integrations that we're continuously building day in and day out to cover as, as much technologies as we can for our customers. Um, and as I mentioned before, all of these rules are mapped to the MITRE framework. And what the MITRE framework is, it's basically a guideline for classifying um, cyber, cyber attacks and the threat landscape the threat actors use day in and day out. And the different um, attack tactics and techniques that we see are, for example, we see execution, privilege, privilege escalation, um, defense evasion. On the right-hand side, you see the full XDR coverage. So this is, this is what we currently have covered right now in our, um, in our rule set, and we're looking to expand this as, we, as threat actors change their tactics and techniques. So let's talk about our SOAR integration and how it's integrated. We use TINES as our SOAR integration. If you guys are not sure with, with what TINES is, it's um, a no-code automation platform. And the way that works is that basically the security alarm sends a SIM signal to TINES via webhook. And then TINES does its magic. It parses the, the JSON to an ND JSON and matches it to a, works, a workflow within TINES. 
And then once that workflow is, is triggered, that's when the automation part comes into play too. It's important to know that we're trying to automate a lot of the SOC analyst workflow here. So for example, the workflow will either query Elastic back and see if there's any other relevant data that may be associated to that event. Um, it'll deduplicate a lot of the events so we can concise, um, say, 20 events into one alert. We also have um, API integration with VirusTotal, so it'll give, give me a, a confidence level on an IP address or a hash value or a domain name. We also do email lookup on external um, breaches. So for example, say there's an alarm that my username or my email is associated with, it'll tell me if my username has been um, involved in any external breaches such as like the Microsoft breach or the recent um, Facebook breach. We also have the capability to query firewall logs on that, on that customer's data source. So say they're, give, they're sending us either sonic wall logs or FortiGate logs, we're able to see if that traffic's been denied or blocked. And then most importantly, the ability to block an IP address within firewall. If we deem it highly malicious, we'll go ahead and block that. So we actually, as I speak, we just announced uh, our white paper with Barracuda, XDR, Tynes, and Elastic and how we partner together to achieve this. Um, it goes over all the features that we've used and the workflows. So if you guys are interested in the white paper, go ahead and take a, a picture of the QR code and we also have some, um, some images in the back as well if you guys are interested. So we talked a lot about the different types of alarms, the threat intel integration, the SOAR integration. Let's look at an alarm to alert um, and XDR in action. So an event is ingested at 4.33 a.m., which it's a Sarah catalog that contains um, a JNDI exploit. Given that we have um, alerts and rules in place, an alarm is generated at 4.36, three minutes later. And then at 4.45, we alert the customer, call the customer, and give them recommendations to patch, um, make sure they're blocking the IP address, doing a user audit, and a software audit. And then at 5.50, we see the customer acknowledges. And then at 9 o'clock, the customer did confirm that it was a server that was vulnerable to Log4j. And then we go, go ahead and close the incident. So within a four and a half hour time period, we were able to take a server that was fully ex fully vulnerable to log4j um, and have it patched. So what does an alert look like from the security operations center? Here is an example of what it looks like. So we, it's broken down into um, three parts. So we have what is the threat, um, what are the different attributes associated with the threat, how, can, how did we detect it, what data source triggered it, and also recommendations. So in this example, this is an abnormal rare hour for a user. So essentially uses machine learning to detect anomalies if a user is supposed to log in in a certain time. So say I log in 9 to 5 and it, I, then I log in at 3 a.m., it'll detect that anomaly and generate an alert. So in this example, this was actually a true positive and that user was actually compromised at a, in a third party breach. Um, and the threat actor actually was able to purchase the cred, um, credentials on dark web and um, compromise the user. So, we talked a lot about a lot today. We talked about data ingestion, how we're, what we're doing, the different rules we're using to, to protect our customers, our SOAR integration, threat intelligence. Um, what, and in the beginning, we asked you a question, right? Like, what if there is another global incident like Log4j, and what are you going to do to mitigate your risk? I think there's four things that we need to think about. Um, one of the things is having a security team in place, making sure you have individuals that are trained to mitigate um, an incident response. Also, having security monitoring place that's looking at your data day in and day out to look for anomalies and abnormalities. Also, having innovative technology, forward-facing technologies, and advanced integrations. And what I mean by advanced integrations, making sure you're logging all the logs that would be useful for any incident response. Um, and I really think the partnership with like Barracuda and Elastic will help you achieve that and help you mitigate your risk. Yeah, that's it. Thank you.